Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Ben Stark of Stark Creations, a custom knife maker specializing in EDC fixed blades and kitchen knives. Stark knives feature clean lines, exquisite finish, and often dazzling handle materials and treatment. Ben, with the help of his brother, Philip, have a thriving Instagram presence, which not only shows off their beautiful wares, but also how they're made. When I first saw Ben's face, I was a little shocked that these refined and confidently produced knives were made by such a young man, but that's becoming a theme on this show for one reason or another. In any case, I've been admiring Star Creations knives for quite a while and look forward to speaking with Ben about what he makes and how he does it. But before we dig in, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click the notification bell. And while you're there, be sure to check out our knife close-up videos, Thursday Night Knives, our live stream, and other great interviews with makers and personalities that make the whole knife world happen. And if you want to support the show and enjoy exclusive opportunities and content, you can do, do so on Patreon. Uh, the quickest way to get there is by going to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. That's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Today's podcast is brought to you in part by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com forward slash knife junkie. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Again, that's www.audibletrial.com forward slash knife junkie. Ben, how's it going? Hi, I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for coming on the Knife Junkie Podcast. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. So, uh, so Stark Creations, I was uh, looking at your website, which actually was the first time I've looked at your website. I'm always kind of tuning in with you on Instagram. <laughs> uh, you guys do a great job there showing Thank off you. all that beautiful stuff. You're welcome. Uh, but I, I did a, a little reading in your about page and woodworking, huh? Yeah, so I, when I first started doing making things by myself, I kind of started by doing wooden spoons and bowls because my grandpa's from Germany. It's so like my dad's family's from Germany, and they kind of always have, when they went hiking in Austria and Switzerland, they would carve wooden spoons out of branches and stuff like that. So I kind of was always exposed to things like that. So then I kind of wanted to try to do that myself. So whenever we had some neighbors or our own trees that we trimmed down, I kind of learned how to carve out some spoons and bowls out of those. Huh, stark. That means strong, right? <laughs> yes, it does. Yeah, yeah. Good, good. <laughs> uh, I took a little German in high school. I was just trying Sehr to show Ah, uh, uh, yeah, Danica. I was just trying to show it off, you know, show how cosmopolitan I am. So <laughs> you started uh, in doing some woodwork and kind of emulating your your uh, grandfather's uh, favorite hobby. Uh, but how did it turn from woodworking to knife making? Yeah, so when I first did the spoons, I was kind of looking. I was very into survival type things. So I would always watch Bear Grylls and look online for how people would survive in the woods overnight and do that type of adventuring in the woods so that's kind of always into that type of thing and making or making your own fun in the woods and also collecting outdoors knives so i was kind of lo into the looking for that stuff online so i would often look at youtube videos as well as online forums so what i often did was go to websites like blade forums and also bushcraft usa i don't know if you've ever seen that one yeah. so but then i would post my wooden spoons on the bushcraft usa website because they had a woodworking forum there where a lot of people were showing off the spoons and bowls that they were making so then i also saw some other people who were posting some knives they made on there so i kind of was thought that it was really interesting so I wanted to do a little bit more research on how I could get into that. So what I did was read through a lot of different threads on all of the different knife making websites and also watch a ton of different YouTube videos mm -hmm. of people that collect knives and also make or modify knives. And I just kind of thought it looked like something that would be a lot of fun. So then I tried it myself 
And then if you want to go ahead and get into like actually making and selling them, I can go into that or that can come out. Oh, 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 we'll get there. We'll get there. All right. <laughs> but, but there are a couple of things you said there that are interesting to me. But um, first, let's start with the spoons. How hard is it to make a spoon? I mean, I understand making knives. Uh, you know, I've spoken to enough knife makers at this point. I, I understand the process and, uh, you know, in as much as a non knife maker can. But a spoon? How the hell do you make a spoon? Well, you, pr you pretty much take a piece of wood and then carve away everything that doesn't look like a spoon. <laughs> so I don't think I have any. Yeah, Spoken like upstairs, a true sculptor. But, yeah, but you basically just split the wood in half. And usually you do it with green woods, so like freshly cut wood, because it's much easier to carve than dried wood. So then I kind of usually just sketched on a rough sketch of what you want the final finished product to look like. And then I have axes and carving tools. I have some over there if you want me to grab some, but I have some carving axes and like a hook knife that has a curved blade that you can kind of hollow out things okay. so you can get better leverage. And then you can either sand it if you want and put some wood finish on or just leave it natural. That that was always the thing that um, that didn't seem intuitive to me. How you get the smooth, kind of convex, concave yeah. uh, shape, uh, smooth concave shape of the bowl of the spoon. Um, but they have those knives. That's right. That that are yeah. kind of hook shaped and yeah. Isn't that cheating? I don't. I don't think so. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Just Unless you want to do it with your fingernail. I'm not sure how else you want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny so uh woodwork uh, uh spoons and bowls and then uh you also mentioned that uh survival knives bear grills and you were collecting a little bit of your own um you know outdoor knives and stuff uh what what kind of knives were you collecting and uh kind of acquiring before you started making them yeah so I first the first few that I got were if you know condor knives yeah. they have they're pretty low end in my opinion now that I know more but they were pretty good at getting started and kind of knowing what's available for outdoor type knives and then once I decided to get something a little bit more high end I got a couple of Becker knives and also then I started getting more into folding knives and I got a Kershaw Zing and a Spyderco Paramilitary 2 and that's still probably my favorite production knife that I have. It's a lot of fun to flip around and it's also really handy and I really like the design of it. So once you started um, actually making knives for yourself, and we'll get to how you got to that point, but once you started making your own knives, did you start losing interest in collecting other people's knives or collecting production uh, I would, knives i would definitely say a little bit because i pretty much i never i really don't like spending money in general so <laughs> i pretty much once i have enough of something that i find useful then i don't really feel the need to have more of them so i like collecting some things but i feel like the ones that if i would want to get something that would really upgrade what i already have then i would need to spend a lot of money on things and i don't really have the need to spend 500 or a thousand dollars on a knife that I won't necessarily use that much. Mm -hmm. So I feel like having the ability also to make and use my own is also a lot of fun, especially like for kitchen knives are probably the knives that I use the most because I don't always carry one around with me. So I feel like mine work really well. So I don't really have a need to get a new one all the time. Right. Right. That uh, it, it seems like if you're at a point where you could just make the knife, it's like, why, why should I go buy that? I could just make yeah. it for myself. Yeah. And folding knives. I would definitely think about since I don't make a ton of folding knives, but yeah. Well, so, okay. Um, you said that you started visiting forums and you started watching people making knives and reviewing knives on YouTube. So this is where you started really learning the craft. Is that, is that right? Yeah, and I learned everything online. Wow, that's okay. So tell me how that how that works. How can you learn something in the physical world like knife making from videos? Um, a lot of practice and tears when things don't go well. <laughs> um, I would say I did a lot of research on YouTube, like I mentioned. So I pretty much watched and tried to learn as much as I could from those videos. There were a lot of videos that had just kind of like overviews of how you do 
from start to finish how to make a knife. And those often were very good for getting a general idea of how to do things, but didn't necessarily go into all of the detail that I would have liked. So that's kind of when forums like Blade Forums, they have a good shop talk forum where I learned a lot and I posted a lot of threads on there when I had more specific questions. Like if I wanted to know what exact belt progression to use for mm -hmm. doing wood handles, then I would post that and people would be really helpful and tell me what they used. And I could kind of learn from that and do some trial and error. And then just in general, being able to just get into it and try it. And then whenever you make a mistake, try to learn from it and try to make the next one better than the one before that. And just kind of learning what can make the process easier and more efficient. And then that mm. kind of, you kind of end up teaching yourself in that way. And then whenever you come across a certain issue that you're having, then if you know people that you can ask and can help you, then that helps a lot too. Well, so did you acquire those people? Did you, uh, did you kind of acquire people uh, that you could ask anything of and kind of get the, get, get uh, clues to help you over the next hurdle? Yeah, I, I don't have anyone in particular that I would always turn to to help me, like a mentor or something. Mm -hmm. But I would say like the people, like I mentioned on Blade Forums, whenever I would post there, they're in general probably around 10 people or so that often are pretty helpful. And then they would be able to help me out pretty well. Okay, so tell me this. You you start making knives, and um, I've made a few uh, here and there. I, I brag about them every once in a while here, but they're uh, back shed knives that I've had other people heat treat, and you know um, I like them. <laughs> they're yeah. good shivs anyway. There's no but, shame in that. <laughs> so how how do you determine, or especially in the beginning? I mean, you look at your work now, which I want to show in a minute. I want you to pull some up in a minute, but you look at your work now. It's very refined. Um, that wasn't just an intro. I mean, you look at it and it looks really clean and really refined, like the hand of a very experienced knife maker. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, how do you um, determine or how, especially in the beginning, were you determining whether it was actually good or just looking good or just looking good to you? Um, well, I would say, and at the beginning, definitely the ones that I started out with weren't very refined, like you mentioned, mm -hmm. but I would say I also, in terms of like selling them to other people, the first few that I sold, I sold to my cousins and my family, and I just kept some ourselves also just to, so, because I didn't really feel like selling them to people because I didn't think they were good enough. Mm -hmm. And then I would say when I started actually getting into selling them, I first listed my price is really pretty low because I didn't necessarily want to charge a lot for things that I didn't know exactly how they would be be accepted by people that actually collect knives and use them. Mm -hmm. So I would say then once I actually sold a couple and I got good feedback from the people that got them, then I felt a little bit more confident and didn't feel too worried about, about selling them to other people. And even now, I still sometimes am like, oh, I, someone's spending $500 on this. I hope it's good. But we get a lot of people saying that they really like them and they use them all the time and work really well. So now I'm slowly becoming more confident that they're actually good. Yeah. The, the, uh, the one, let's say uh, it's a type that a, a common design I see you making is that sort of chisel style one in the upper left that's on the screen right now. Mm -hmm. uh, those, okay, so there was a... Oh, Mike, that there's the cleaver there. Yeah. Uh, and then the, the chisel one with the ring. God, look uh -huh. at that. That's so cool. Thank you. Um, yeah, you're welcome. Uh, I saw one review on your site where um, a roadie, um, presumably for a rock band or some sort of traveling show, uh, carries that uh, chisel with the ring, the chisel mm -hmm. style uh, blade with the ring. And uh, he made in his... In his little comment, he said, every new town I go to, I pull this out and people are like, ooh, uh, ooh and ah over it, pass it around. And and uh, and he uses it to great effect. Um, so how, where does that design come from? And how do you sort of choose what you're going to make? I mean, your designs seem, uh, you've got the kitchen stuff and then you've got the EDC fixed blades. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you design them and how do you determine what you're going to make as a regular model? Um, I would say in terms of how I come up with designs, I personally get a lot of inspiration from other knife makers. So like you mentioned with the one with the hole, I have one of those right here. It's one of the ones on the website. 
like I get confused which way to hold, <laughs> move <laughs> around. Um, like those, I originally I came up with those because I saw some other people doing similar things. Like Berg Blades is one guy that mm -hmm. I find his work really nice. And he was doing some, they're kind of like karambit style. They have a different blade shape, but they have that same ring. So I kind of thought those looked really cool and I wanted to do my own spin on them. So I kind of took one of my other models. So I did an EDC cleaver before that, which mm -hmm. was the same general blade shape, but without the hole in the handle. And then I kind of enlarged the blade a little bit and also made the hole in the handle. And then the name that I give them is Loch, which is hole in German. No. So that's kind of why I named it that because it's kind of a nod to the German roots yeah, and yeah. a good way of describing them. And then I usually, whenever I design things, I first do it on paper and sometimes I cut them out in cardboard or any other type of little bit firmer material that I can kind of mm -hmm. hold it in my hand. Especially when I started out, I did that a ton. And now that I kind of know a little bit more, I kind of know what's going to work before I actually do it. Just since I kind of have a better sense of proportion and all of that stuff. And then whenever I'm designing a new thing, I either first cut it out in general steel and do a single one off of that one. And then if I like the way it looks, then I'll do a bigger run in water jet, wa sorry, excuse me, That's in water jet cut. And then I will usually design them in a CAD program. And then those I'm able to send to the water jet company and they're able to cut them out for me. So that, that's gotta be a great help that, uh, especially with the ring, those ring yeah, knives. Cause that, those I didn't ever do without water jet cutting. Cause I don't really have a good drill bit to do those. Yeah, man. I was going to say drilling out that, uh, okay. I attempted once to make a karambity style knife, uh, that ended up being, I, I ended up just chopping that part off and that was yeah. the, my one attempt. And then I determined afterward that the way to do it would be to just have some stock drill the hole in it. And then once the hole is nicely drilled, then cut everything else around it. Yeah. And I did the opposite and what a disaster that was. Um, yeah. it was I, like I, didn't even, those... I didn't even try that. <laughs> oh my God. Well, I, I'm sorry. I know you just put it back down, uh, put it down, yeah. but pull out that, that little tanto you just had um, and, and hold that up a little bit closer to the uh, camera so we can take a look at that. There we go. So that's a hollow ground blade there. Yeah. The main bevel here is hollow and then that's flat here. And that, so it looks like that ring, that hole could be used or not used. You know, it could be, it yeah. could be something that you could put your, your finger yeah. through like, or you could get a firm grip without yeah, it. Yeah, I can hold it like this or through like that. And then you can spin around. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's cool. Uh, but also that, I mean, that ring is, is helpful in a, um, in like the bird and trout knives that have those rings. Mm -hmm. they're, they're not there for doing cool karambit tricks. They're there so that if you're working on, I don't know, gutting a fish or a bird, you can kind of let it dangle from your hands as, as you yeah. use your hands to do other things. And then when you need it, you know, you can just flip yeah. it back and then use it. And that's what uh, occurred to me when I, when I saw your knives with the, your loch knives mm -hmm. is that they are, um, you know, that that ring looks purposeful in a different way than say a karambit. Uh, something that we're that we're used to seeing. Um, your handle work is very intricate. You use a lot of um, really interesting looking materials, and uh, some of them, like uh, well, the one that you were just showing, has a very definite uh, mm -hmm. uh, inlay. Yeah, inlay. But some of them uh, seem like they're crazy woods. They. Or, or something, I don't know, they look like they have constellations in them and they're all uh, dyed. The uh, resin hybrid ones, maybe. Is that is that what that is? What What is okay. that? Yes, yeah, so like this one is a green resin and then it's a choya cactus. So it's like a cactus. I don't know if you've ever seen those. And then once they're dead and dried out, they have a lot of oh, little holes in them. Yes, so yeah, then yeah. they cast them with the resin and then it kind of fills up those gaps. And I really like the way those look. It's kind of a blend of traditional and modern materials. I think you just, uh, I think that last one right before this one, which is really cool. I love that design, but uh, that upswept Tanto is just gorgeous. Uh, but this one, that looks like G Carta. Uh, yes, it is. Oh man. I love that material. Yeah. I like their material. Um, yeah. It's a, I like my Carta, but often it's a little boring. So there's a really nice, a little bit more interesting to look at. Yeah. So 
once once you started making knives i mean was it a just um a, a revelation to you um and what uh, i mean by that is that yeah. well what i mean by that is um you know you it seems like you started off uh in woodworking not really with my with knives in mind but mm -hmm. they just sort of evolved obviously it took because your work is so you know uh, obviously you throw everything into your work uh what was it about knives that that's why are you not still making spoons and trying to make that go um i would say and definitely knives you can get a lot more variety in the things you make so like mm -hmm. you have all the different styles of knives that you can do and all the different handle materials and blade finishes and blade steels so there's a lot more a lot bigger range of things that you can do because spoons you're always working with wood and you can use different woods but most of the ones that you do for carving are pretty soft so they mostly are pretty light woods that don't have that much interesting grain and then also i would just say without trying to sound uh greedy it's also a lot easier <laughs> to make more money with spoon or with knives and spoons because it's like spoons you usually can't necessarily sell for more than like 50 dollars, and that's pretty lucky if you can get that much out of it right and a knife you can get a lot more for a pretty similar amount of time and then i also feel like i like things that really can get used well because spoons I, and if you cook a lot then we my family has a bunch of my spoons and bowls in our kitchen and house and we use them a lot but definitely knives is a little bit one step up from that so you yeah. can use the kitchen knives to make meals or in the yard and it's a lot more versatile in their function i would say and it seems like they could last for generations in a way that a spoon might just just have a lifespan due to the materials. Yeah, and a good a good spoon will last you a long time too if you take care of it. It's also kind of like a knife, but because we have some that our grandpa carved, and those are probably like know. forty years old, probably, and they still work pretty well if you keep them well taken care of. Don't throw them in the dishwasher. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so is there, and, and this is going to sound, I, I'm not trying to be facetious or a smart ass, but is there a, a spoon community? Like there's a knife community? Oh, oh, definitely. I would say maybe more like a woodworking, like green woodworking and spoon and bowl carving. But I would say definitely right, there is right. one. And that's kind of an offshoot of bushcraft maybe? Yeah. Or just woodworking, I would say more. Or green woodworking. Because you can also do like chairs and that's a whole another thing. So okay, so we've seen and we've talked a little bit about the about the small EDC blades, um, and then you make kitchen knives. And to me, those are um, obviously kitchen knives are the knives we probably most of us use the most. Uh, we all eat, you know. We all have to cut our food, um, and kitchen knives to me seem like a like a whole different challenge because you have to get that grinds so thin and so even and flexible and, and the heat treat, I would imagine, I don't know anything about it, but I, it seems like the heat treat might, you need, might need to do that differently to get a springy. So what are the challenges of making a kitchen knife? Look at this beautiful set. I mean, my Lord, <laughs> what, what are the, what are the different challenges or the unique challenges to making a kitchen knife? Look at that. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's well, that is something I'll, else. I'll, I'll take any positive <laughs> exclamations you have. <laughs> okay. um, I would say the challenges definitely. I would say the most thing is that everything has to be functioning well. Because like on outdoors knives, usually it doesn't matter so much if the grind is perfect or not. Because usually the things that you're cutting outside don't really need to be a perfect geometry in order to cut them. And mm -hmm. when, whereas if you're doing a kitchen knife, you're like you mentioned, you really need to have the grind nice and thin so that the edge slides through it really easily and the food doesn't stick too much. And then that's really challenging when you're grinding because since you don't want to ruin the heat treatment of the knife, when you heat up the edge, you often have to keep continually dipping the knife in the water bucket under the grinder and make sure that you aren't building up heat. So like when I first started out doing the kitchen knives, I often was grinding with one hand and then I had my hose in the other hand and then I was spraying water on the grinder while I was grinding with the sander. And then that would be very messy and cold once it got in the winter months. Oh, geez. But now that I have my setup a little bit better and I have better belts and stuff, I don't really need to do that quite as much, but you still need to really watch out for the heat building up. And then I would also say the one thing that's tough about kitchen knives is just getting a design nailed down that's really comfortable and also very functional that also still looks attractive. 
because you really need to think about where the hand placement and how the edge is in relation to the handle. So let's see here. So like if you can kind of see here, then I usually have the handle angled up a little bit so that your hand has enough knuckle clearance above the cutting board or whatever you're cutting on. And just thinking about stuff like that is very important with kitchen knives. Uh, do you find that the handle materials you use on um, on the the kitchen knives have to be different from the handle materials you use on your EDC knives because of all the acids and stuff that they might encounter? Uh, I don't really make much of a distinction. Usually I don't use too much micarta with the kitchen knives just because I feel like it's a little bit more porous. And if you have like mm -hmm. meat juices or something, I wouldn't want it getting absorbed too much. But if you polish them up nicely and seal them with wax or oil, it's probably not much of a big deal. But other than that, most of the handle materials are pretty consistent across all of the knives that I make. Just because I feel like in general, as long as you're taking care of everything, and like you've mentioned before, not putting things in the dishwasher, and you use good epoxy and fasteners, then it usually is not too big of a deal. Well, what, what part of that process, well, of the whole process of either... You know, making either kind of knife or any kind of knife, what part do you like the best? Um, I would probably say doing the handles in general because in, it's the most rewarding part for me because it doesn't require as much work as sometimes the blades. And like when you're doing the Damascus, then your fingers will get acid covered and the mm. metal will start rusting. And it's just kind of a more of a hassle. And the handles, I have a good process of it. And it's really exciting to see when you're using wood, kind of seeing the grain pop or buffing it and seeing how the grain looks or with micarta, seeing the pattern emerge once you start sanding it to finer grits. And it's just kind of one of the more exciting parts of the knife making too, because like I mentioned, you have so many different wide variety of exciting looking materials that really yeah. give the blades totally different looks depending on what material, material you're using. Yeah, and it seems like... Um... That's the point where I'm, when you when you're making the handle, that's the point where you're taking it from an abstraction in a way, you know, it's this blade and then you mm -hmm. have this big blocky uh, handle. But once you start to shape it and remove everything that's not a smooth, yeah, definitely. good looking handle, it starts to be something that you can actually use. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's definitely true. Um, so also with the with the steels, you were talking about um, Damascus steels. Does your process differ uh, I mean, I know there's some, there are some parts of the process to bring out the, mm. the, uh, the patterns and such, but uh, when you're working with Damascus steel, is that a, a whole different ball game? Um, it's not too different. And the same you, in general for every knife, you have to cut it out, grind the bevels, heat treat it and do all that. I would say though, the main thing is that like when you're doing the finish work with the Damascus or other carbon steels, you have to watch out for rust forming a lot mm -hmm. more carefully mm -hmm. because you make sure that every time you're putting it away that you keep it oiled and make sure that the finish stays good. And then, but other than that, it's really not too different, I would say. Okay, so you talked uh, earlier about, oh, wait, wait, we'll, we'll get to my question in a second. The knife you made for your grandmother, I, I know, I, I, saw that i think you put that up on mother's day yep. that one with the green handle that says nana on it um what a beautiful knife and what a what an amazing gift to be able to give uh someone what tell me a little bit about that knife before i before we move yeah. on to this next next question yeah so our grandparents are definitely one of our biggest supporters and they've always been really into it and i think my grandpa and grandma as well they are really happy whenever we do something that's creative or kind of a more experiential thing that you kind of can show off that you're working hard and they really appreciate whenever people work hard and stick with things. Mm -hmm. So it was really nice to be able to make something for them that they will be able to enjoy using because they always like having their bread in the afternoon and the tomatoes in the summer. So they uh -huh. wanted to work on a project that they would be able to 
choose a handle. So we picked out a handle with them and custom ordered the material that they wanted. And it was really fun to be able to work with them and make something that they would really like and be able to use at their house. And when we go over there, then we'll be able to use it too. Are they yeah, Are they the Stark side of the family? Uh, so they're, is... they're my mom's parents. Uh, okay, okay. I was going to say, yeah. that, that, that'd be crazy to have Nana on one side and then their last <laughs> name on the other. Yeah. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the business aspect of, of things. Um, and uh, firstly, like the thing that really struck me is when you uh, talked about water jetting and and how the the ring... EDC, the Loch knives are what really um, uh, kind of inspired you to use a water jet service for cutting out blanks. But besides that, and the obvious reason being the hole uh, and getting that right, how have you found uh, that using water jet helps your process? And it just speeds up the whole process and makes it a lot more efficient because pretty much the entire cutting out of the knife blanks is pretty much anyone could do it. And it doesn't really require too much skill not to downplay anyone that is finding cutting out knives difficult. But I would say that just standing at the bandsaw and cutting out things and drilling holes and grinding the rough profile of the knives takes a long time and is a lot of consumption of consumables like belts and bandsaw mm -hmm. blades and drill bits. So just being able to cut multiple days out of the workflow really speeds up the process. And if you do a big enough batch, the pricing really isn't too bad if you can make your own CAD designs, which I learned to do. And then I would just say, like I mentioned, it really makes things efficient because I can get 150 blanks cut out and have them just sent to me. And then that would probably take me four weeks to do. And then oh. I could, this way I can do it and actually finish a lot more projects and work on things that require a bit more time and dedication and attention to detail. Right, right. And it seems like if you're not worrying about cutting out the profiles, you have more more time to, um, what am I looking at? To sort of polish your skills, the, yeah. the, the more difficult skills. Yeah, that's you know? definitely true. And, and it's more concentrated and focused. Mm -hmm. um, so you'll, you'll get, do you choose certain models that you want to have cut out? Because I know I yeah. saw, I was watching one video where you were just kind of experimenting with that uh, upswept sort of Persian-y four inch fighter, uh, cool looking knife for sure. Uh, you're welcome. So with that one, that was an experiment or, or, or a lark or just a one-off. Um, so something like that, obviously you, you would just cut out and, and do soup to nuts, but on your regular models, um, you just, you just sort of choose a model and, yeah. and have it. So I would say like a lot of the Damascus ones I do, I cut those all out by myself and the okay. other carbon steel ones too, because in general, I do less of those. So and also the ones that I choose to get water jet cut out are the more standard models that I would consider that I make more consistently. So we have like four EDC models and three or four kitchen knife models that usually those all get water jet cut out just because they don't really change from batch to batch. And then it's kind of nice, I think, always to have something consistent that people yeah. can kind of recognize and order from. And then being able to make one off things is also really nice for when I can cut things out by myself, because sometimes you want to try out something, but you don't know if people will want to buy them. So then it's always a lot more expensive when you're doing water jet to do single knives, because it's much more cost effective to do batches. So then being able to do one and kind of get a gauge the feedback of people on Instagram or wherever I'm sharing them is a good way to kind of test the waters and see if people would be interested in doing that. And then if they sell well or people are interested, then I'll usually try to make a design and get the water jet cut out later on. So um, Stark Creations isn't just you. You work with your brother. Mm -hmm. uh, how does he fit into the, um, into the Stark Creations team? Yeah, he does a, most of our like financial stuff. So he keeps track of all the spreadsheets and sales and communicates with a lot of the customers. So he does a lot of the customer service or planning out of orders with everyone. So he'll kind of communicate with them and see what handle materials and blade finishes they want. And then he also, we kind of 50-50 do the social media, I would say. So mm -hmm. we kind of take turns posting things depending on what particular piece of content we're wanting to share. And then he also does a lot of the packaging 
and we just kind of work together to decide what we want to make and what the best way of ordering materials is and just a lot of that type of things. But I do, I do most of the actual grinding and making of the knives and knife making. Yeah. That's, that's a really, uh, invaluable kind of partnership. I, I know just from doing this podcast, my partnership with the, with our producer, Jim is, uh, I, you know, I, I know that I wouldn't be able to get, uh, most of this accomplished without him and yeah exactly to, and to have someone um i also have a special love uh on this show that is developed of family businesses i love hearing the stories of people working with their brothers working with their fathers or 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 what have you because to me that's part of you know to me um someone making knives and making a living at making knives is it's a dream. It's the American dream. It's a dream. It's a whatever, you know, um, whether it's an American dream or just a dream, it is a dream. And then to be able to do that with uh, family, to me, that's another aspect of of that kind of, a, well, I'll say it like that kind of American dream, you know, where it's a ma and pa operation. In this case, it's a bro and bro operation. Yeah. And but, I, I won't downplay my parents' contributions too. It's always, they're very supportive and helped us because we still live at home or I do. And my brother is in medical school too. So he kind of lives here on the weekend and stuff and they support us a lot. And it's really probably wouldn't have been able to do it without them. And they always are really good at giving feedback and working together to kind of see what the best next moves would be and what types of things we should be doing. Oh man. Yeah. So it, the plot thickens, that's even more of what I'm talking about. Just getting family input and um, I don't know, being able to not have to go it alone yeah. so that you can, you yourself can focus on your, your craft and your art. Um, so how, in terms of new designs and, um, and how you plan to evolve your, um, uh, the knives themselves, what kind of things are you looking at doing? Um, I would say... I want to do a lot more various kitchen knife designs and maybe kind of experiment with larger and also other steels. So Mm -hmm. I recently I did one, let's see, I did the brisket knife. If you saw that one, that was kind of a one-off one that I was trying out because I was kind of experimenting with that. I don't, I don't remember the brisket knife. Um, Was that a long slender upswept? Uh, Somewhat. Yeah. It was like probably 11 inch blade or something i posted a youtube video of how i made that one too oh oh, oh yeah i yeah. think i know which one that yeah. is yeah it had an ironwood handle and oh yeah yeah and then just like experimenting like i said with different steels i would like to do a little bit more with that and just if maybe eventually if i decide to get a forge or something and make my own steel that would be another another rabbit hole to dive down but right <laughs> now i don't really have enough time to start doing that Right. So I noticed uh, a, a definite, um, well, you got a new grinder at some point. I wasn't, I'm not aware of what the date was, but you seemed thrilled with it. And you, you started doing different sort of uh, examples of, of how that grinder was uh, improving your, your whole work experience. How, uh, how much, like when you started, you just started with a one by 30, mm-hmm. um, grinder and some files how what has it been like growing your shop and what's your shop like right now yeah and definitely every time that you get a new and improved tool it really makes your workflow a lot more efficient so when i the probably the biggest upgrade was either upgrading from the one by 30 to a two by 72 or Mm. getting a automatic metal porta band that made cutting out things so much easier because I originally I did a hacksaw and that takes like an hour to get through one little thing. So now I can just kind of zip through handle material and steel pretty quickly and then just kind of keep building up additional tools and upgrading those kind of just makes things more enjoyable. So like I got the Broadbeck grinder recently, a few couple of months ago, and that has enabled me to do serrations a lot more easily because it flips Mm. horizontally. And then, so if I'm grinding a kitchen knife, let's see, it's like if you're doing serrations, if you're doing it, the wheel is usually, usually if you're doing it vertically, then the wheel is horizontal. Mm -hmm. So if you're wanting to grind your serrations then you have to tilt your head and grind it like that. But if you're able to do it horizontally, I can just hold it here and then go across like that. 
and then so the whole belt turns on yeah its the side. whole the whole grinder flips over horizontally wow and what kind is that what uh, that's broadbeck ironworks broadbeck um yeah the uh the one that you had before that uh i noticed you you scrawled something on the side of it um yeah then, i i had a bunch of stickers and also i think i i got that one in tw 2014 which is when germany won the world cup and we've okay. been big soccer fans and one of our favorite players was miroslav Klose. so i wrote miroslav on the side because i thought okay. it sounded like a cool badass <laughs> russian name or something <laughs> it does yeah i would grind oh. knives now yeah with miroslav <laughs> so uh um you're so uh the social media meeting the um meeting the business um what am i trying to say the business model how much of that is necessary i mean how much did you grow on social media how much did you learn well, i know you learned a lot from there uh, but is this where everything that you're doing is being sold? I primarily, I would say, I probably eighty or ninety percent to go through Instagram in general, and then we also have our website where people can order the uh, the already finished ones, like you pulled up earlier. Mm -hmm. And then people can also email through the website, which happens decently often. But definitely, in having the ability to connect with an audience through social media, like Instagram, has definitely been a big help for us. Yeah, I, I can't imagine what the knife world would be without Instagram at this point. <laughs> really, I mean, because it's perfect. It's the perfect medium, it seems like. If if you can't be there touching it, I, I almost think it's better than YouTube. YouTube, it takes um, some commitment. You got to find the video, yeah. then you got to spend the time and watching make it, it. Making the videos is a lot harder. <laughs> yeah, right. Making the videos. But but as a, as a consumer and as a collector, if you can find, you know, you you find a design that you like and you subscribe. And then just every time they upload something, you're, you're seeing it. It's an immediate impression. And uh, that's how I, I find so many knives now. That's, that's where my, uh, you know, and we're guys, we're visual people. Right. And uh, you know, so for me, it's, it's that gift of being able to just see and discover yeah. knife makers. And I, just I really like it for, stuff giving a behind the scenes and showing people how things are made. And it kind of really emphasizes that it's a handmade product, because if you just looked at our website, you might think that it was maybe like a, some machine made thing or something, but being able to like post behind the scenes and show that it's a real person making the products, I think is a big help. And I also learn a lot from other people's posts of how they show their process. Yeah. So are you doing a little bit of that giving back through these videos now? Do you, have you had people reaching out to you? Yeah, for sure. And I, I all the time people ask me questions about the processes and also send emails or DMs and I try to help as much as I can. Sometimes I can't give great advice if it's something really general, but I do the best that I can. And I think that trying to help and share share whatever you learn is always a good way of kind of getting people to feel like they trust you and kind of help build a connection with the people that follow you. Yeah. And it, it seems like knife makers are some of the most open people out there in terms of sharing tips, sharing, you know, processes and things that you've learned along the way, because, oh, there you are with a cleaver. <laughs> That's so cool. Because uh, it's not like anyone else is going to be Ben Stark. You might, you might show them how something is done or how you do yeah. something, but they will take that and do them with it so to yeah. speak and i always if someone wants to copy exactly how i do something and they end up doing it as well as i do then i'll say all the power to them because it's definitely not easy and it takes a lot of practice and hard work so i applaud anyone that goes for it uh so i i noticed also you have some stuff that is out some knives that are outside of your um usual catalog if i can call it that um so do you take custom knife orders just someone has an idea um and they come to you and yeah i would say within reason we do that mm -hmm. and there's sometimes people 
come up with ideas that I'm just like, okay, we can't do that. <laughs> but if people are interested in just modifying one of the designs a little bit or have an inspiration that we can kind of work with and then make our own spin off of, then we definitely are always open to doing that. And that has also been one way that we've come up with a lot of new models to make. Because mm. like the skinning knives that I've been making in the last year or so, that was originally someone wanting a custom order skinning knife and they kind of sent a couple examples of ones that they liked. And then I came up with my own sketch kind of based off of those a little bit with my own spin on things. And now we make a lot of those lately. Uh, Jim has shown it a couple of times that Tanto with the, with the deep swale kind of on the back and the teardrop handle. Mm -hmm. uh, did that start as a custom? Um, I think I came up with that one myself. Like I call it the Persian one the Persian. and I, it's like all my other designs. I, I probably have seen someone that did some type of recurve on the spine. And then I kind of modified my Tanto and kind of made it with a little swedge on the top and just kind of always trying to come up with something a little bit different and to widen the things that you have available. So that's kind of, well, that is self-expression right there. Um, how do you feel when you're using CAD? Is, is CAD uh, just a way to translate something that you've already done in paper or steel? Or can you be feel free to express yourself in the computer uh, medium as well? Yeah, and I would say usually it's more of a way of transferring paper to the computer so that we can get it cut out. But I definitely have had some times where it's nice to not have to erase every line that you do when you're trying to make minor tweaks. So when I was doing more prototyping, then I would be able to kind of mess around with the angles and everything. And that definitely helped a little bit to be able to do that online. Yeah. It's interesting. It seems like some people are so comfort comfortable in that, uh, in that realm and that's their main mode of expression. Uh, whereas, uh, other people, you know, I would imagine I would fall into the latter category of people who, you know, are way more comfortable with pencil and paper and going through scads and scads and scads of designs and papers until you get it exactly right. And then bring it over here and input it. Yeah. Um, uh, it is amazing to me that some people can, can feel free to express themselves through, through that. Oh my God. Okay. So we're looking at, uh, Jim just put up some examples of your work. If you're, if people are only listening to this <laughs> and uh, I'm, I am struck again by the, by the handle materials here are all of these materials that you find, or do you make any of these? Um, the majority I have made or find on Instagram. So like a lot of them are ones that people have made for us custom on Instagram. We wow. work a lot with the blank space on Instagram. He does a lot of the resin and wood hybrids and he's great to work with and has a lot of really nice resin colors. And then some of the other ones, like one of the ones that were was shown previously, why I do a lot of the material combinations, it's like the inlays, like I showed on that one Tonto earlier. And then that is a good way of just kind of like combining different types of materials. What are those wood resin, um, uh, the wood resin material uh, mm -hmm. handles, what do those feel like in hand? Uh, I, I, it feels pretty much like any other handle material. I, it's rel The wood feels pretty nice to like normal wood. And then the resin feels, it doesn't really have much of a transition or anything. And it's okay. pretty smooth once you sand everything and buff it, it ends up being pretty everything's really nice and smooth and easy to hold. I'm sorry. That's a bizarre question to ask, but, I, <laughs> but, but I think you're getting at it because it seems like there's wood and there's resin and yeah. you, you know, wood is a cool, smooth feeling and, yeah. and resin is more of a, a tacky or oh, yeah. hold, hold that up. As, yeah. I just finished that one today. That is... Oh, wow. So that Damascus, what, tell, tell us a little bit about that Damascus. Yeah, that's, it's, I would say more of like a ladder pattern and I believe it's like 52, 100, 10 or 15 and 20 and a couple other ones mixed up together. And I usually get those from Alabama Damascus. They make a lot of the Damascus that I get. And then I also have some people that have sent me pieces to try out or also ones that I've ordered online from other makers on Instagram. Like for example, uh, like this is some San Mai that I had made for me by mm. Gam Gambler Custom on Instagram. Wow. And that's like a mini axe. That is crazy looking. That steel is 
Yeah, that's really cool. It's one of my favorites when it works out nicely. It has a really interesting look. It does. So what about blade show or other knife shows? Do you attend them? Uh, what do you get out of them? Yeah, I've gone. I went to blade show one time so far. I definitely mm-hmm. would like to get back eventually. I would say it kind of, I would like to just go and kind of talk to some of the people that I know pretty decently well through Instagram. Like mm-hmm. the first time that I went to was maybe 2016 or something. And I was pretty new still and didn't really know too much or that many people. So I was kind of just walking around kind of a little too shy to talk to people. Mm-hmm. But now I feel like I'm a little bit more confident about talking to people that I don't know so well. So I think I'd definitely like to get back eventually. It just kind of depends on if I'm in school. I was in school last few years. So that kind of was made it a little bit harder to get there. Yeah, I was talking to someone recently who was saying that um, not only is Blade Show a great place to go press the flesh and and meet up with friends that you only know online and that kind of thing, but also it's a great place to hunt down materials, mm-hmm. uh, which I, I didn't really realize or think of. I haven't been there. This is going to be my first year. I'm very excited. Nice. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, I guess you can go there and get anything related to knives uh, as well as all the materials. Yeah. And like so the grinder companies usually have displays there and have demonstrations and handle materials and blade steels, man. So, uh, someone who's been listening or someone who watches, or I'm sorry, well, yeah, watches your videos, but also, uh, follows you on Instagram. They want to get a knife of yours. What, what should they do? What's the best way to go about yeah, it? And the best way is either sending us an email through our website or sending us a DM on Instagram. I would say we usually respond within an hour or two. Right on. So, uh, and, and, uh, you know, also I'm curious Right now, you're a one one man band in terms of the making, and sometimes you're using uh, water jet and such. But how do you hope to see Stark in the future? How do you hope to grow the company? Um, I would say, and I can't actually get too much more in terms of production done. But one thing I wouldn't mind doing is maybe doing a couple more more intricate po- projects and just kind of making a few more one-off things and then just listing them for free sale because sometimes it can get a little bit overwhelming with having a big long custom order list so you feel like you have to make sure that you're always on schedule for so being able to kind of do that and make more of what exactly you're wanting to make would be definitely one way that I would like to do it I don't necessarily think I'd like to hire a bunch of people or work hire work out because I feel like then you'd kind of lose the home handmade feel of the product a little bit and also i feel like you would really need to be able to sell a lot more to make it worth hiring someone full-time to do it right right and and so it does that explain how you feel about collaborations either with other custom makers or with um production companies yeah and i really like actually working with other makers i've done quite a lot of collaborations in the past like half face blades i did a couple collaborations with and tactical pterodactyl oh cool i've done quite a few different people i'm sure i'm forgetting some but it's a lot of fun to kind of work on some of the products that you see from other people that you've been following and kind of see also what they do with your designs it's like the half face blades ones. They did a really awesome job and did a lot of really cool handle material combinations and different blade finish than what I would typically do. So it's really cool to see what other people end up making with what you're used to. That's funny because you mentioned half face blades and the first thing I thought of were their handles. And then you mentioned tactical pterodactyl. And the first thing I thought of was, oh, similar blade shapes, at least in terms of, uh, you know, same universe, at least in terms of your small EDC. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we, we kind of started at the same time. I remember he was one of the first people I kind of talked to and followed and thought he was kind of on the same same type of trajectory that I was at. Wow, oh, that's that's exciting. And uh, well, I like that you plan to, I don't know, kind of just grow organically and keep it handmade. And uh, that's your thing. Yeah, and I I always like keeping my options open and not not being stuck in doing one thing also. So that's why I also still like want to do more schooling and stuff just so I, in case something ever goes wrong with knife making that I have other options available to me too and that I can kind of spread my knowledge around and not be not be tied down to one thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I feel the same way. I mean, I've kind of been that way um, too. Like 
you can always have your creative, um, at least for me, it's always been creative, uh, having a number of different creative pursuits going at once, of course, being uh, strong, going strong on one thing, but always having, um, you know, I think most creative people are like that. They have uh, other things that they like to do as well. Yeah. And uh, man, obviously your knife game is incredibly strong. So you can, you can always fall back on knives, yeah, son. But, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, well, Ben, thank you so much for coming on the show and, and sharing a bit of your, uh, your knife making life and your career. It's, uh, uh, it's really impressive work and uh, it's, it's, it's happy looking work too. Even the stuff that's menacing looking, you know, some of your, some of your, like your Persian and some of your EDC stuff has that more, uh, you yeah. know, ta tactical look, but, but really beautiful, refined and kind of joyous uh, in, in how you're putting them together. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad that comes across because I really do enjoy being able to make them. And thanks a lot for having me on here too. Oh, it's a great pleasure. Ben, take care. You too. Thanks. Ever order a knife online and have it delivered to the office so your wife doesn't know? Chances are you're a knife junkie. Speaking of my wife, uh, as that as that liner was just uh, doing, um, before uh, we were rolling here with Ben, I was kind of dropping hints. We're doing dishes, and I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, I'm talking to this uh, this this really talented young man tonight who makes you know he makes some really incredible kitchen knives." And I just kind of let it. Let it go like that. My wife is a great cook, and and uh, you know we'll we'll see about that. So I I planted a seed tonight because I'm slick like that. So baby, if you're listening, which I know you're not, uh, maybe there's a Stark kitchen knife in our future, but uh, uh, we'll we'll see about that. Um, anyway, it was a great pleasure talking with Ben. I love his work, as I mentioned earlier, and and like I said, I I've been following him for a while. So to get to know and get to meet the person behind the knives is always my great pleasure. Uh, tune in next week for another one of these views inside the knife world from the people who are making it happen and uh, find out what makes some of these knife makers tick. Uh, in the meantime, check out Thursday Night Knives and check out our Wednesday supplemental show where I just get to bloviate about my own collection and new knives coming out and, uh, you know, kind of do that thing. So for Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, thenifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at thenifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast.